The Once and Future Nerd, Book 2, Myth Made Flesh. Chapter 2, What Used to Be Enough. Part 1 by Rhiannon Angel, Ian Harkins, and Christian T. Kelly Madeira. Part 2 by Ian Harkins, Christian T. Kelly Madeira, and Gregory M. Schultz. Part 3 by Christian T. Kelly Madeira and Gregory M. Schultz. Part 4 by Rhiannon Angel, Zach Glass, Ian Harkins, Christian T. Kelly Madeira and Gregory M. Schultz. Part 5 by Rhiannon Angel, Ian Harkins and Christian T. Kelly Madeira. Uh, okay, uh, let's calm down before uh, we get hurt. Uh, yeah, someone's gonna get hurt. <laughs> Answer my question, you splintable fuck. Did you know? I don't know what it is, okay, okay. you... Okay, clearly she's delirious. <clears throat> Just leave for now. And leave you alone with her? Sam Billy. I think Sir Brennan would Billy, be Billy, a... okay? Just trust uh, me. Fuck you! <laughs> Stay right the fuck here and answer me. You'll recall it was thus that Yellowin was unceremoniously dismissed from the quarters of the queen he ostensibly served. To his credit, he did do as Jen asked him. Billy. You could knock, Weenie. It's a tent. One of these days, you're going to walk in on me and your mom. <sighs> Jen's called for you. Seems urgent. Well, what are you shitting around for, then? Yo, wait up! She's up? I must go to her. Give me just a moment. If you wish. She's not forbidden you. Yellowin spent a few minutes wandering the Freehold camp, aimless and frustrated. At last, though, he did bring himself to the tent where Sir Brennan slept, the old knight having watched over Regan through the night. Sir Brennan? Aye! Ah, uh, <clears throat> Yellowin. Is anything wrong with Her Majesty? I thought you should know she's awoken. Ha! Excellent news indeed. I must go see her at once. How are her spirits? She is certainly spirited. Good, 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 good. Let us go. Well, that is the peculiar thing. She was very agitated when she woke. I was sent away to fetch Billy, which I've done. But when I politely suggested you might be of more help, frankly, Jen insisted otherwise. That is odd. That was when Brennan saw the ash and soot on the bottom of his own boot. Grim souvenirs of the fire in the forest. But if those are Her Majesty's wishes, we had better heed them. They weren't, necessarily. It was Jen who gave me those instructions, and though the Queen did not object, we might still be within our rights. Nia says Jen has already surpassed her in her skills as a healer. Best not to interfere. Sir Brennan, I have tried to ask politely, so now I must be blunt. Until Her Majesty declares herself, there is no House Gwenatal as far as the law is concerned, and therefore no Kaltir to House Gwenatal which is to say I serve you and her at my own pleasure. Aye, it's greatly appreciated. I don't believe it is, and I must now insist that I be somewhat better informed as to Her Majesty's affairs. Your request is not unreasonable, Kaltir. Brennan approached Yellowin and placed a strong but friendly hand on the elf's shoulder. I'll voice your request myself. In the presence of everyone, as soon as she's through this ordeal, does that sound fair? That reminds me, Nia said she'd require willow bark to treat Her Majesty's pain. Come, let us go to the forest and gather- I will not! Yellowin shrugged off Brennan's hand and backed away. I did enough of your chores the other day atop General Riverfell's ramparts. The same day I saw you riding west as though Garidian's ghouls were on your tail. Now, if you do not tell me what Her Majesty was doing out west, I shall go and ask her myself. Kaltir, you must understand before you act rashly. Very well! Yellowin kicked a cloud of dust towards <coughs> Brennan and took off in the other direction. God damn it! The old veteran gave chase, but catching up to the famously nimble young elf was a terribly tall task. Meanwhile, in the foothills south of the ruined keep at Blackhold, Relotit, Lord Commander of the Elven Knights of the Wood, oversaw the digging of a large pit filled with dry wood. Her usually stern features broke into a smile as she watched a small group of her outriders approach. 
they led a cart loaded with the broken, mangled bodies of orcs who had been lucky enough, I use the term loosely here, to briefly escape captivity and extend their lives by a few short hours. Ah, Sergeant Samin. I see you've had good hunting. Yes, Taid, and might I say how these new horses earned their keep? I should hope so, with how much I had to fight the High Council to get them. Uh, uh, Taid, far be it from me to question any of your orders, but, but might I inquire, purely for my own edification, why we did not march them back across the Black Mountains before the culling? To the unlearned, it would seem that would reduce the risk of escapees being found by the Memia. Because, Sergeant... I have the experience to know these are certainly not the only loose threads for us to cut after a battle such as we've had. It's a week's ride across the mountains in perfect weather. Perhaps you'd prefer us to be stranded over there for a fortnight while the eastern realms spiral out of our control? Uh, uh, Thank you for your tactical insight, Taheed. Now get these unloaded and throw them in with the rest. (laughs) Yes, Taheed. Shame that these old orcs are such poor sport. <clears throat> Our new recruits could use better target practice. The time for sport has passed, Sergeant. We must always mind the hierarchy for objectives. This business was far too sloppy for my liking. It won't happen again. <clears throat> Tight. Why is this one all wet? Found it in the river east of Freehold. Perhaps she was fool enough to think the water would hide her stink. Might have floated all the way to Brimshire if we hadn't ridden so hard. Well, then it seems you should have ridden harder still. Or was I unclear about the importance of discretion? Taheed, she was already... Did I ask you to speak, Sergeant? Gods, I ought to have the lot of you flogged, but I'll need your sore asses in a saddle every waking hour to fix this mess. Now please tell me her pup is in the pile with the rest. Her pup, Taheed? Rilo Teet's already stern face curled into a snarl. You left... The pup behind. She was alone, Taid. Are you ignorant or willfully stupid? Orcs wear that garment for one purpose only, nursing their young. Ree gestured towards a strip of cloth slung from the dead orc's shoulder to her waist. With all due respect, Taid, we detected no others nearby and were, were quite thorough in our search. If she had a child, we would have heard it. They may be savage, but surely not even a savage would run without her babe. Surely? Ree walked briskly towards her underling, drawing her shining saber from the sheath across her back. Taid! And then she knelt by the corpse. <sighs> Sweet listener, I should very much prefer to spare you from the gruesome particulars of what happened next. But if there is one thing I hope you have learned from our story thus far, it is that sometimes the less one wants to know how the sausage gets made, well, the more one needs to learn it. In one smooth motion... The leader of the Talahil sliced through the cloth that covered the orcish woman's naked chest, held up a breast in a mailed fist, and roughly cut it from the woman's corpse. She tossed the appendage to her lieutenant, who caught it fluidly. Now what say you? Uh, the flesh is waterlogged, Taid. But you are correct, her mammary glands are engorged. I shall go back to the river at once. The child could not have gotten far on its own. No, Sergeant. I'm certain your bungling has done enough harm for one day. I'll return to the river and find the little wretch myself. You go south to that cave. Bring me back this shield of so-called legend, and perhaps you can keep your rank. I'm to go alone, Taid? Take a recruit with you. If you die, I'd have some reconnaissance on the trap that killed you. Taid, uh, if I may... What is it? We passed a Memiet Inn upriver, this corpse, perhaps... Yes, yes, I know that one. A good suggestion, Samin, though not enough to outweigh your errors today. Yes, Taid. Were my orders unclear? Sergeant Samin saluted his commander, then scurried away. Relatit gathered the fabric she'd torn from the orc's body. She studied the cloth, adorned with clumsily stitched yellow birds... Frayed, worn, loved. She brought it to her nose and breathed deep. Not far away, at least not nearly far enough for my liking, Arlene and Madame Bailey worked outside the horse's head. Arlene somewhat awkwardly attempted to fold sheets, while Bailey, also awkwardly, held the mercifully sleeping child. I tell you, Anna, another night like that and I'll have to put you in the stables. I can't have my guests kept up all night with this one's caterwauling. Of course, now he sleeps, the wee monster. I'm so sorry, Miss Bailey, 
I'm sure Gail will be back by tomorrow at the very latest. We'll secure a better place for him. Galladin's grapes, girl! You'd think you never did laundry a day in your life. You don't roll it into a ball. You lay it out flat and... Ah, uh, here, take the wee one. Let me do this. Arlene gingerly accepted the swaddled bundle from Madame Bailey. <laughs> For she's gathered her skirts above the knee And she's gone to the wishing well to see If the man that she loves waits for her All alone at the wishing well And as Arlene sang to the child, utterly ignoring the finer points of linen care, she absently fingered the embroidery on its blanket, adorned with clumsily stitched yellow birds, frayed, worn, loved. Oh, Gail, please, please hurry. Now, I needn't remind you that while Yellowine had been wandering the freehold camp, Billy and Nelson had arrived at Regan's sickbed and heard her tale of grisly slaughter. Nia had arrived shortly thereafter. The Queen was understandably loath to repeat her story for the third time in an hour, but her hand had quite literally been tipped when Nia discovered a skull-shaped burn mark on her palm. And so we'll pick up the tale with Nia having just heard of the horrors of that western forest. She sat wide-eyed as the colour left her face. Gallatin's mercy! Such wanton cruelty! Yeah, well, those fuckers don't know me. I'm gonna show him wanton cruelty. Now someone go get me that pointy-eared piece of shit. Yes, we must ask Yiluin to tell his parents on the High Council. What? Did you hear what the fuck I just said? Surely such barbarism, such butchery, is not condoned by the elven leadership. Why not? Nelson, the elves are... They are agents of order and blessed among the people of this world. What, what order? The order where, where hundreds of kids get shot? No, that's my point. Realitate's actions are clearly some monstrous perversion of the High Council's intentions. And if they knew about it, they could put a stop to it. Or more likely, they can put a stop to us to keep us quiet. Now, I'm serious. Somebody will get me that splinter pool fuck. You're squeamish about killing him? Fine, we could use a hostage. But keep him the fuck here. Your grace... You were quick to point out Realitit's secrecy regarding this sortie. Wouldn't that indicate her not wanting the High Council to know? Or more likely, the High Council not wanting any of us sorry sons of bitches to know. What need would the High Council have of secrecy? When dealing with external threats to the human realms, which is to say orcs, the Council's will is law. Oh, fuck it. <laughs> oh, cock Where in Galadin's <sighs> name are you going, Your Grace? Since I'm the only one who seems to care about keeping us alive, I have to go get that two-faced asshole myself. At that exact moment, Regan would not have needed to look terribly far for Yellowin. For after his futile argument with Brennan, he was sprinting towards their tent and was just now close enough that his elvish ears could more or less make out the proceedings. I care about keeping us alive. I have to go get that two-faced asshole myself. Yellowin's been lying to our faces all this time his buddies murder children. Yeah, while crying mothers watch. If it was up to me, I'd cut his cock off and feed it to him. But one way or another, we gotta keep him here before he rats on us to his friends. Because if I was them, I'd be thinking about tying up loose ends right about now, starting with the dumbass humans poking around my shit. Fine. So we keep the Caltier here. But I must say he may surprise you with his loyalty. I doubt that. I need not tell you the look of dejection that came over Yellowing's face as he heard this all. Kaldir, let us please talk through this. Billy, get Brennan. Tell him I'm alive, but he needs to shackle Yellowing right now. Uh. As Billy stepped out of Regan's tent, he came face to face with Yellowing and Brennan, standing a mere 20 yards away. For a brief, tense moment, Billy and Yellowing locked eyes. Yo, weenie. Been out here long? What is going... <clears throat> Yellowing threw an elbow into Brennan's gut and darted away. Shit! We're supposed to shackle him. Save your breath, lad. You'll not catch him on foot. God's help us. In a frantic near sprint, Brennan all but dragged Billy back into Regan's tent. What has Yellowing just heard? I'll tell you later. First get him. He's gone. 
Well, fucking go get him now. He's a faster runner and rider than any of us. We'll need to outmaneuver rather than outrace him. But I must know what he's heard to do that. Does he know you were spying on the Tarlow Hill? Not unless he's been there a while. That is Will. But he knows we know about his friends being child killers and that I intend to make him pay for it. And he probably did hear Her Majesty threaten to dismember him. Dis... what you mean, child killers? Short version? What Rilo Teet didn't want us to see out west was she was marching hundreds of orc women and children until they couldn't walk and then shooting them all to death. Ah, clearly there's been a grave misunderstanding, which I think I can explain. Would... you like help off of the floor? There's no misunderstanding. Fuck me. (sighs) No misunderstanding. Saw it with my own damn eyes. To start, there's no difference in the savagery of male and female orcs. Both are equally vicious. Uh, can I, can I push back on that just a little? Yeah, I'll push back. You're fucking wrong, Brennan. These women were unarmed, and they were trying to protect their children. And I'm short on time and patience for you to second-guess me. I would not second-guess your grace. Only offer hard-earned wisdom to better inform your decisions. Now, you say children, but I must wonder... Chill. Dren. To emphasize her point, Regan held up the palm of her burnt hand for Brennan to see. It still bore the unmistakable impression of the infant orc's skull seared into her flesh. Despite himself, Brennan recoiled slightly. What in Galadin's name is that? It struck me, too. It appears to be the visage of one of their young. A babe, it seems. No, you're mistaken. A smaller breed, perhaps, but orcs don't have wee little babes. They're pulled nearly full-grown from pits of mud. Okay, that's obviously not true. There's a lot I don't know about this world, but flies don't spontaneously generate from meat. I really doubt that sentient humanoids just pop out fully grown from mud. I know it beggars belief. But my eyes fucking don't. And I know what a grieving mother looks like, Brennan. Of course the summary execution of unarmed prisoners of war is troubling. It's a God's damn sight more than troubling, but sure, close enough. We need a plan, and fast. Aye, this is where your decision to spy complicates matters. That will make it very hard to explain how you came by this knowledge, but I'll think of something. Hard to explain to who? The Elven High Council, of course. Thank oh, you, come Sir Brennan. On. Obviously, Commander Relatid has to be made to give an account of herself. A petition should be made for redress. Provisions for prisoners of war are made very clear in the Second Concordat. Is anybody fucking listening to me? Your Majesty, they will be the first to condemn and to discipline her for her troops' overreaction in the field. Overreaction? Aye, my queen. This was a well-planned massacre. Did Relatid give an order to kill them all? She didn't say it out loud, but that's not... Then what you witnessed was a tragic failure of discipline for which the Lord Commander must answer. You're not hearing me. They were disciplined. They didn't look panicked. They looked like their dicks were hard for anyone to do something so they had an excuse to start shooting. I understand that what you witnessed seems callous, your grace. But I speak from experience when I say that these things can get out of hand. To be in close quarters with such dangerous creatures as the orcs are, we'll put the best soldiers in the world on edge. How in the fuck have I become the moral guidepost of this outfit? Tell me something, Brennan. If you're such an expert in combat, you see a little mule and thing that can't even walk latched onto its mom's tit. Under what circumstances is that thing going to scare you enough to shoot it? Nothing coming to you? Good, because if you have an answer for that, you're an awful soldier and a God's damn coward to boot. Your grace, it is right and good for a queen to be outraged by needless violence. But that outrage must be properly directed. And right now, the proper course is to tell the High Council and let them tend to their own affairs. With your leave, I'll go to them and... Fuck no! Do you have a death wish? If I go quickly, I can lessen the harm of your misunderstanding with Yellowing. Brennan, listen to me. I know right in my guts, the second the elves find out we know what we know, we're going to have the world's biggest bullseyes on our backs. You go there, you're just going to get yourself killed first. So no, you do not have my leave. What would you have me do then, your grace? 
If you can't stop Yulaween getting to the White Forest, then draw me up a battle plan. A battle plan? What's my first move, last resort, and end game if I want to survive a war against the elves? Why in Selberin would we go to war with them? I'd go to war with them because they're fucking monsters and because fuck them. But we're going to be at war whether we like it or not once Yulaween rats. I cannot do that, Your Grace. You can't? To start with, it's not a winnable fight. Then make it a survivable fight. You survive it by not fighting it. We survive it by not sitting around waiting to die. Your Grace, the elves are the keepers of order in this world. And the orcs are agents of chaos. This is the one fight in which I will not back you. I command it. Aye. I feared you might. I'll not do it. Nia, my memory is hazy. Would you please remind us all of the vow Brennan of Greyfield took when I knighted him? I know what I vowed, Your Grace. Say the words, Nia. Perhaps we should all let our hearts and tongues cool before we... Say the fucking words. Sir Brennan, you swore you would bring honor to your liege in all you do, and obey her every order. May Galadin help you. Aye. Why don't you go on, Nia? Your Grace, in exchange, you vowed you would never give your knight a command which would bring a disorder or disgrace. This command of yours would bring untold disorder. And to the memory of all my fallen kin, and to all the people, armed and unarmed, who I've seen savaged and brutalized by the orcish hordes, it would bring intolerable disgrace. And so I must refuse. Leave, Brennan. Get out of my tent. Please let us not do this. Whatever we are about to face, we need each other more than ever. It is Her Majesty's right to dismiss me if I... I ain't dismissing you from shit. At least not yet. I want you to think, Brennan. I'll give you until dawn tomorrow, and I hope you realize how much that means I value your help. But whatever you say to me when you come back in here... You better be God's damn fucking sure you mean it. I, that I shall. Then Brennan was gone, a dread silence filling the tent in his formidable wake. With little to be done as our party awaited Brennan's decision, Billy and Nelson had taken to practicing their swordsmanship at the camp outside Freehold. Look, dude. <laughs> My parents are literally experts on this. Yeah, on Earth. What if we're missing something here? There's no way that every single orc is so evil that they gotta shoot kids. You sure you're not making this too much about you? No, like you're not. If it looks like a genocide and quacks like a genocide, you don't just wait and see what's up. But what if we make things worse by getting in the way? Gentlemen? Hey, 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 wait, wait up, wait up, wait, wait, wait up, wait up, wait up. Yes? Okay, okay. You, you, you got a minute? Yes, but just. Jen is alone, trying to medicate you-know-who. Galadin, help her. Okay, all right, we've, we've been talking, you know, because of everything. And maybe you can clear this up. What do you know for an objective... Scientific fact is different between humans and orcs. You mean aside from the many reports of savagery? I think you could pick the right pieces of anyone's history and make them seem savage. So, yeah, aside from that. Well, it is true that in antiquity, both humans and orcs lived in a brutish state of near-constant war, amongst themselves as often as betwixt each other, But our ancestors had it in their nature to come together for a greater good, to learn a common language, to see the wisdom of the concordats, and generally to treat with each other in a civilized manner. This was not true of the orcs. Maybe the orcs just had it worse under the elves, so it wasn't worth rolling over. My ancestors did not roll over, Nelson. Under the elven peace, these realms have enjoyed 3,000 years of stability, which, Galadin help me, I've been asked to help break. Aren't there, like, four civil wars going on right now? Of course there's been conflict, but it's chivalrous now. No longer does a losing clan face total annihilation, 
And there are the countless elven technologies and magics from which we've benefited during the peace. You do still shit outside, though. Where would you prefer we shit? What, what he's trying to say, I think, is that 3,000 years is actually a really long time to still be, you know, fighting wars with horses and castles. Maybe the elves are holding you back. Uh, if you boys would like a history lesson, I can refer you to some excellent books. But then, I ought to see to Jen. No offense, Nia, but that doesn't really answer my question. What's different between humans and orcs that no one could possibly argue about? Or is, it, is, there, is, is there anything? Well... Skin and eyes, I suppose. What's up with their skin and eyes? Their skin is an ashen gray, and their eyes can be anywhere from the yellow of bile to the red of blood. Uh, sorry, uh, that's it? Cannot the scales of a serpent betray the potency of its venom? Nia, I can't believe you... They're evil because they look different? It could be the other way round. Some foul or vicious behavior that creates the appearance. Do you not hear yourself? You sound like such a hypocrite. In what way have I contradicted myself? I think he means because you're both, you know, black. What? What does that mean? Well, like your skin. My skin? What's black about it? It's a shade of brownish tan, I suppose. Lighter than Nelson's and darker than Sir Brennan's. Jesus. Nia... Where I'm from, anyone who looks like you or me, our skin is the first thing people notice. Yes. Well, it does cover most of our bodies. No, no. I, I mean, people assume stuff about us. Well, it would be fair to assume our ancestors came from warmer climes. Yeah, but that's not, that's not what I mean. It's like, you know... it. Okay, look, you're not smart, no. you're lazy. Mm -mm. No, nobody asked you. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying that's what people think. Some people. But that's absurd. You don't see how that's the same as what you're saying about the orcs? If you went around and looked at all of our palms and lips, you'd see all of us share the pink of vitality and health, which the orcs lack. All of us, that is, assuming Regan has not murdered Jen by now. Yeah, man, I'm actually kind of worried about that. Maybe we can talk to Nia more later for Jen's sake? All right, fine. Just think about one thing for me, Nia. Would the elves be anywhere near as powerful as they are right now without the orc gems? I don't know, Nelson. But the more docile orcish tribes work in the mines and trade their gems to the Tarlow Heel, so there's an argument against widespread slaughter. What do they trade for? Just because I do not have every answer you seek does not necessarily mean that you are right. Now, if that's all... She nodded curtly to the boys and then strode off. Should we know, keep training? Nelson glared at Billy. What? Fucking Fox News over here. <laughs> Meanwhile, by Regan's sickbed. <laughs> Regan, goddammit, just drink the goddamn tea. No, I hate it. By now, perhaps you can, listener. Imagine Regan's displeasure towards being nursed as a convalescent by her comrades. What are you, five? Yeah, five fingers deep in your mom. <gasps> For those of you already well-versed in the art of storytelling, you may recognize that calling it displeasure is what we in the business call understatement. Good afternoon, Your Grace. Oh good, it's the fucking Temperance Brigade. Doing especially well, I see. Regan's health had not miraculously improved in the two days since her near encounter with immolation, but her spirits had, well, plummeted, as you can plainly hear. You still run in a cloister, or can I have a god's damn drink yet? Your Grace, the herbs will speed the healing. Strong drink will hamper it. If you would heed... I ain't gonna heed a thing from someone who has to fake it even when she fucks her own hand. Regan, please listen to us. Listen to you? You? Oh, let's think through that one, shall we, Sunshine? If I listened to you, the elves would know who I am. If I listened to you, we would have put ourselves straight in the hands of those motherfucking butchers. For all I know, if I listened to you, I'd been marching with them instead of watching. Is that it? Am I forgetting any other great places your council would have put me? Jen looked stung, but offered no reply. Just because her advice was not proven right does not mean it was bad advice or ill-given. Now may I change your bandage? No, it fucking hurts. Gah, that's why you're supposed to drink the tea! 
fuck a tea. Will you stop being such a baby? In her frustration, Jen grabbed Regan's wrist to unwrap the bandage. I need hardly tell you, this was a misstep. For with a speed forged through honed instinct and practice, Regan had spun around, grabbed Jen's arm, and pulled a small concealed dagger out from somewhere on her person. This despite the cast on her dominant arm and the bandages on the opposing hand. Regan held the polished blade between them, wincing through her pain but holding steady. Regan, you don't ever put a finger you want to keep on me in anger. That's my bad. Let's just... Put that weapon away, you fool! This, coming from Nia, shocked both Jen and Regan out of their stalemate. Come again? Speaking freely here, your grace, for someone who swears disdain for all manner of pomp and pretense, you are perhaps the most prideful person I've ever met. You dare call me vain for fretting about scars, yet you refuse to acknowledge your own. And I don't mean the ones on your body. You'd rather wound your friends than admit you are wounded. I don't have friends, and this is the fuck why. Refusing to acknowledge friends is not the same as not having them. That young woman you've seen fit to bear steel at, despite your abuses and insults, I've seen her confide in you, counsel you in good faith, fight by your side, and keep herself up at night, navigating the confoundingly precarious politics of holding your confidence while still minding your well-being. That is a friend. Regan did not yet let up, but her eyes flicked over to Nia more than she might have allowed at her most composed. And somehow, she is the best friend you have. If you cannot see that, then I struggle to imagine your reign lasting more than a few weeks. So please, in the name of whatever it is you respect, put the blade away. For a moment, all was quiet. Regan's breathing slowed and her eyes stilled. And then she flipped her knife back to its unseen pocket and at last released her grip on Jen. Happy? Not nearly. Well, I guess that's too- I believe an apology is in order. Are you shitting me? I am certainly not. What are you, my fucking school mom? There's a saying my parents were fond of. Galadin rules alone. All other kings hold court. So let's examine the standing of your court, shall we? Your best tracker and archer has run off, probably after overhearing you swear to dismember him. You have exactly one knight, whom you've backed into an impossible corner. You've nearly stabbed your closest confidant and best mage and healer, and you've royally pissed off your second best mage and healer. This is not a path to prosperity, victory, or effective governance. And I promise you, by merely uttering the words, I'm sorry, you will not spontaneously burst into flames. I shouldn't have drawn on you, Jen. It's fine. I'm sorry, okay? I'm over it. What do you want from me? If someone threatened you with a knife, would you accept mere words by way of an apology? What then? Lick her ass? I think you should surrender your weapons. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right is right. No fucking way. It would be a show of good faith to all of us. Nia, I swear I don't have patience for this shit. Well, I do. And I am not in pain. Ugh! Fuck you and your religious fucking conviction. Fine. Find me some brandy, and I'll give you all my ranged weapons. And combustibles. And blades over six inches. Nine inches, and you leave me the bottle. No. You can have one sip every two hours. Five sips every six hours, and I decide what a sip is. In return, you get every weapon that's currently outside of my body. Very well. If only because I shudder to legislate the particulars of the last condition. Better hop to it. Come along, Jen. We shall return once Her Majesty has decided to comport herself in a more becoming manner. Nia gave the smallest curtsy that etiquette would permit a clerical acolyte to give a queen, then left. Jen made no such gesture. In fact, as soon as she was certain the queen's eyes were closed, Jen made a rather different sort of gesture in Regan's direction before also walking out. Though he had ridden hard to return to the White Forest as quickly as possible, Yilluin now found himself in want of the will to open his parents' door. 
But when he looked back over his shoulder in the direction of Freehold, he remembered the bridges burned there. Eloine's been lying to our faces all this time while his buddies murder children. Yeah, while crying mothers watched. If it was up to me, I'd cut his cock off and feed it to him. That's metaphorical, Bridges, not literal. Indeed, if Eloine had gone around freehold committing arson, I'm not sure there would be much room for redemption in his particular story. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, with queasy guts and reddening cheeks, the young elf put his hand on the door, steeling himself for what awaited him inside. <sighs> With an unnecessarily tremendous creak, as was its wont, the massive door swung open. As it did, the once still home came to life as servants sprung from their beds to care for the unexpected guest. Please let my parents know I've arrived. Yiluin handed his pack to a passing servant, watching as she walked towards the living quarters. Yiluin? Yiluin looked up to see his father, Bartluil, coming down the stairs. Greetings, my sire. You must forgive me for arriving at so late an hour. Yiluin knelt to greet his father in the traditional manner. Oh, child, stand. There is no need for that. Bart grabbed his son's arm to help him up. But after how we... All of that is in the past now, dear child. Although House Gwenatol is without a successor, it is clear Sir Brennan remains a great asset in the realms of men. You were wise beyond your years to see that. Ah, yes. Well, about Sir Brennan. And you should have known to retrieve me right away. Just then, Yilluin's mother, Winlyodik, emerged from the hall towards the living quarters, berating a servant. At the sight of her child, Win's mood appeared to change. Eloine, our warrior has returned. The battle at Freehold has been the talk of the wood these past few days. Sire, my deepest apologies for disturbing you so late in the night. Oh, nonsense, my dear child. You've represented our name and family well. There is no need to apologize for being here. But, thank you. I I was so worried after our last discussion that you would not have me back. Let us go and sit and you can recount the battle to us. Yiluin finally allowed himself to relax in his parents' home, and in doing so found he was quite tired from the strain of the ride. He followed his father towards the parlour with his mother close behind. Would you like anything to eat, Yiluin? No, thank you. I'd just as soon... I'll ring for Ruby. Now as to the battle. We've been dying to hear. Ah, yes. Well, the story in fact begins when Lord Commander Rilotit sought Sir Brennan out as he left the wood. As it happens, she actually... Ruby! That blasted girl grows lazier each day. It's quite all right, sire. I could scarcely eat a thing. Nonsense. We pay enough to feed and house her. Ruby! There you are. Have you gone deaf, girl? Bring meat and wine for Eloine. The mortified-looking human servant girl bowed her head low and scampered out of the room as frantically as she had entered. I do declare the help these days. Shall I have her whipped? If she did not understand the first two times, I doubt a third would make the difference. Amidst this exchange, Eloine searched his parents' faces for a hint of compassion towards the pathetic creature they had just berated. He could not rightly say he saw any. Why not trade her with another house? And risk her behavior there, reflecting on how we run our house? I think not. I think we must remind her of the comfort in which her family is permitted to remain. At the mention of the human girl's family, Yiluin could not stop a look of worry from creeping over his face. Anyway, Yiluin, you were saying, what's the matter, dear? Was it the battle? I forget your experience has been limited to skirmishes before. There's no shame in being troubled, you know. But you must remember that the feeling will pass in time and that your actions were right and just. It is not the battle, exactly. Well, then what? You are free to speak your mind under this roof. I'm afraid it would not be my own mind I would be speaking. Just a wild story brought back from a... a memiot soldier. Oh? I sincerely doubt the tall tale, and yet I find myself unable to forget it completely. It involves the killing of a great many orcish prisoners by the Tarlohiu. The briefest of looks passed between Yiluin's parents. 
Relo Teat is not known for recklessness or wanton cruelty. If she exercised her power of summary execution, which is of course her right, I'm certain she did it with good reason. Yes, of course. It's only... To hear that this soldier's gossip, many of these orcs were, well, they appeared as children, and their mothers seemed to care for them as Memyet do. I see. What a peculiar story. Like I said, truly a tall tale, if I've ever heard one. For, of course, orcs care no more for their relations than they do for their hated foes. Isn't that right? Yes, of course. I'd pay no mind to this wild gossip. The undisciplined rabble of Memyet fighters are known to tell any manner of tale in the wake of battle. I trust this wasn't one of Sir Brennan's men who said this? He seems too noble to allow such talk within his camp. No man of Sir Brennan's said this. Good. Brennan may be our last best hope to restore order to the realms of men. It would be a shame if he suffered such fools in his ranks. Do you know how many men yet have heard this fanciful nonsense? Uh, very few. I'd not have heard it myself, save for our gifts of perception. That is well. Men yet are susceptible to gossip. I must wonder why anyone would lie about such a ghoulish thing. Who can say? Knowing the type as I do, I'm sure this soldier sought to use this lie to advance in some perverse way his own selfish ambitions. Well... I suppose I could believe that, though it is a relief to hear it said out loud. Forgive me for troubling you. Not at all, child. What must parents do for a child nearly grown, besides help him find the path if he's gone astray? The Urk yet really are most different from the Mem yet. In a way that renders sympathy misplaced? It is the difference between a lap dog and a rabid wolf. Yes. I do wonder sometimes whether it's quite fair to compare the Mimit to dogs. Maybe not to the dogs. Oh, hush you. <laughs> joking, joking. I, I only mean that, having spent much time among them now, I've seen the Mimit display a tremendous complexity of thought and breadth of passion. Far more than I'd been led to think possible. Yes. Well, it can't be denied that some of them have left a meaningful mark on history here or there. There will always be the odd few who transcend the limitations of their race. Perhaps Sir Brannon is one such. But then, by the same logic, mightn't we expect the rare exceptional orc to be noble enough to love its child and feel the pain of losing its kin? They would love for folks to think that. Yulowin, have you ever heard of the blueback spider? I'm not sure I have. What the blueback spider loves to eat above all else is the common robin. Now you, being schooled in the hunt, might wonder how a beast which crawls on its belly through the muck might prey upon one which flies on the wing through the blessed air. Does it weave a web? Oh, that would have to be quite the web to stop a robin mid-flight. No, my child. When the mother robin is out feeding herself, it crawls into the nest. Mm, and eats the eggs. No, for it cannot digest the shell. It lays on top of them, and this is where its name is telling. On its back is a pattern which, from a distance, resembles the eggs of the robin. By the time the mother is close enough to notice the ruse, she is close enough for the spider to strike. And thus is her natural mother and instinct used against her by a vicious predator. Ah, quite devious. And it is thus with the Urk yet. It has always been their goal to convince the Mimiet of the lie that they are more like them than not. And in that they must never succeed. They intend to eat the humans? Well, I don't think they'd rule it out, but that's not what we mean. The taller heel enforce the peace of the Concordats, yes? Of course. And they are the mightiest fighting force in Jordan. Yes, quite. If all the armies of all the Memiet allied together, which they have never done in recorded history, they would still be hard-pressed to challenge the taller heel. Likewise, this Traff Devil just got more of the Urkia tribes to fight together than ever seen before. And they were routed by the taller heel. 
Thanks in no small part to you, my child. But if the Mimid were ever fooled into seeing the Urked as their allies, and Galadon forbid they all fought together... One night of the wood is worth thirty of any other warriors in the realm, but they might be outnumbered fifty, sixty, even a hundred to one. And then all of this, everything you have come to cherish and depend on, would be in jeopardy. I see. And that is why you must return to your Memiet just as soon as possible. I'm, I must what? You must return at once to stop the spread of this potentially ruinous lie. But I've only just arrived home. Well, this will always be your home, dear. Now set to it. I thought after the strain of battle in the right here, I might rest for... End up. Oh. You know, I'm not even going to comment on the doors anymore. I'll just let the absurdity speak for itself. Anyway, the serving girl Ruby entered once more, bearing a tray of food far too large for her to comfortably carry. Ah, oh, yes. Yiluin will be taking that on the road. Would you wrap it up? My sires, I fear that in light of recent turmoil, I may no longer have the complete trust of the Memiet. Well, you had better go and get it back quickly. And under the circumstances, I think we must be kept informed of your fare and as often as possible. How shall I do that? We'll think of something. Now, if there's anything you should need from your chambers for the journey, you should go and fetch it. Yiluin's parents stood, as though to politely imply that Yiluin should do the same. Yes, I... Yes. Lacking any other option within the bounds of propriety, Yiluin took their cue. I'll send for David. He can be counted on. Yes, that's for the best. <sighs> it would appear Relotid is getting careless. I must call for a council meeting tomorrow. Daylight had just begun to depart the White Forest, and Yiluin had returned to his chambers to gather supplies. Though, as these things often go, his heavy heart had weighed down his feet. Some grew impatient at this. Yiluin, are you almost ready? Yes, sire. Just a few more minutes. Oh, for the love of all that is... No, 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 no. You told yourself you wouldn't get worked up. It's not worth it. <sighs> My child, we've gotten you something to aid in your task. You have? Sire, what... <clears throat> what is this? They're messenger pigeons, child. We'll make it very easy indeed for you to stay in contact with us. Simply attach a message to one every three hours and it will return to us. Then we'll send it right back to you. But I've no experience training birds. Well, you remember your old friend Devar, don't you? Then entered a male elf near to Yellowin's age. Yellowin! My old dear friend! Good graces, how long has it been? Hello, David. Oh, we know each other better than that. Call me Dave. Very well, Dave. It has been many, many, many years. Ah, and what a cruel accident that has been. Yes, an uh, accident. <gasps> and don't you worry your head about the birds. I'll take care of them. <whistles> See? I'll take it care of. Oh, I'm ever so excited we're going to be taken to the road together. We'll give us a chance to catch up. You'll be ready to go in just a moment, won't you, Yellowin? Yes, it won't be much longer now. Well then, I shall await you in the foyer, old friend. <sighs> Yellowin sat on his bed and buried his head in his hands. Oh, what new doom is this? Yellowdick? Well, there my baby sibling is in the flesh. What are you doing out there? Well, I was trying to come in here and hide from Dave Odd. Thought he'd come to propose to me for the umpteenth time. But clearly it's you who has the news to share. I'm not sure I'd call it news exactly. Did you bring your mem yet back again? Is that what's got our parents in a tizzy? Are the men yet here? Can I see them? No, sibling, but it seems I'll be returning to them very soon. 
You do look troubled, if I might say. In truth, it has been an eventful week. I left here on quite bad terms with our parents, rode into more than a few battles, was welcomed back with open arms only to then be rushed back out the door. I came here hoping to gather my thoughts, and now they are more jumbled than ever. I know that feeling. You know what's good for that? <laughs> <laughs> And so did the pair sneak out of Yellowin's window and into Yellowdeek's chambers to partake in that kindest of herbs, cannib root, grown in the white forest, no less, so you know it was that good good. But why the pigeons? <laughs> they want me to stay in touch. I need to send a bird back every three hours. Well, good thing you have Dave to keep you company. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he really is the worst. I can't believe our parents looked well upon his marriage proposal. Add it to the list of my failures in their eyes. Speaking of which, they wanted me to leave hours ago. You're like to incur their wrath by sheltering me here. Well, I get blamed for all of your bad decisions, no matter what. Might as well try to be a good sibling. Need another hit? <laughs> Don't mind if I do. I don't know what they have against this stuff. It's given us from the earth and makes everything so... pleasant. They don't like it because it lets you see through their lies. But at this, some of the euphoria on Yellowin's face was replaced with a tinge of worry. What do you mean? What lies? Just like the whole system. You picking up what I'm putting down, baby bruh? No, but I really wish I were. It's like, wouldn't you rather be a sparrow than a snail? I suppose so. Rather be a hammer than a nail? I don't know what in Galadin's name that means. Balefil explains it so much better than I can. You should talk to him. That's your paramour? Mm-hmm. Still? That hard to believe? It is hard to keep track. You're still an ass, babe, <laughs> <laughs> But the worry had not left Yellowin's face. He looked to his sister, searching for some opening to vocalize his concerns. This effort was undercut by Yulidik's attempts to pour honey into her mouth directly from the jar. <laughs> Sibling, what do you know of orcs? <clears throat> the Yurkit? Well, very little, poor wretches. Why do you ask? I'm curious of late as to what separates them from the Memyut. Well, mostly the Black Mountains, I suppose. I can't tell if you are joking. Well, here's what I can say for sure. As you know, I'm something of a connoisseur of Memyet songs. So you said. It turns out the oldest songs of the Memyet in the Far West aren't terribly different from the Yurkit songs. That implies a shared culture at some time past, or at very least that they once broke bread together. How do you know what orc songs are like? Balfil has traveled over the mountains. You forget that he was Caltier to Einhurst before that all went to Selbrin. Ah, <sighs> he's so worldly. He learned a few songs and brought them back to me. But now I'm not I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but well, I think the fall from man to orc is less of a sheer cliff, more of a gentle slope. But the skin and the eyes. Surely that's a stark contrast. Is a brown horse truly that different from a white one? Our parents liken the divide to the one between a lapdog and a rabid wolf. Lapdog is a telling choice of words. I'm sure that's a comforting thought for them. Must ease their sleep. W what do you mean, ease their sleep? Has it ever occurred to you that there is far more of humankind living under this one roof than there are members of this family? I suppose I hadn't considered that. 
In the very room where we eat, there is one entrance for us and three for our servants. If they were barely removed from savage beasts, wouldn't we all be in terrible danger? Then, does that same thought not disturb your sleep? Oh, the men yet like me. I talk to them about music. You see, I always try to put positive energy out into the world and trust it'll return to me. But Yellowin in that moment looked the picture of anything but positive energy. What's the matter? Are you freaking out? Oh, here, grab hold of this quilt. Let it be your constant. Yellowin, this is getting absurd, child. I think you better go. I can only shield you so much. Yes, I... Thank you. We must talk again soon. Perhaps I would like to speak to your Balofil. That can be arranged. Here, take some route for the road. Oh, and if Tevad asks, I'm not at home. Of course. And then Yeludic proceeded to hide herself under her bed. Yeluin. Come in. At the camp near Freehold, Billy, Jen and Nelson were taking their evening meal. They'd grown accustomed to doing this in the company of their full party, but... Well, I'll leave it to Billy to remind you of the situation. So this all went to shit quick, huh? Should we be jumping on this? You know, to do something? Mm, like what? I don't know. I mean, I know we talked about hanging around until the elders or whatever and until Nia could do some research, but who knows when that's happening now or if... Maybe we should try to move the timetable up. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going anywhere until this orc stuff gets dealt with. We help make this mess. We got to clean it up. This isn't kindergarten, dude. You heard how they were talking. Shit's about to get real. Shit's already real. Even realer then. I'm just saying, I don't think we all have to die just because you've got black-white guilt all of a sudden. No offense. Oh, I can't, can't see why that would offend me. Look, I'm not saying we peace out first chance we get, but I'm still on team keep our options open. We were always going to have Nia help us with research, right? So maybe we can do it sooner than we thought. That's all I'm saying. Okay, fine. We'll talk to Nia. But I'm staying until we fix this, and you should too. Be pretty fucked up the bell right now. You're not wrong. This just could get to a point where there's nothing we can do. No sense being a martyr just to prove a point. That is literally what a martyr means. But okay. So, um, who's gonna talk to Nia? I will. Yeah, I should talk to her anyway. I haven't seen her since this morning. Anyone mind if I kill the stew? Now, at that moment, Nia had taken to the side of a small pond just far enough away from the freehold camp as to be quiet. There she knelt in silence with her hands clasped. Holiest Galadin, God of order and Lord of all lords, Watch over your children in this time of trial. Deliver us from chaos. Show us the path that should be and grant us the courage to walk it, now and at the moment of our deaths. Amen. Sir Brennan, I didn't see you there. Forgive me, Nia. I didn't mean to surprise you. It's all right. What brings you down here? Forgive me if this is an intrusion, but... I thought, you being a woman of the cloth and all, we might pray together. Oh, why, yes, of course. <laughs> when I was a girl, I aspired to lead the prayers at some small country chapel like my parents did. Feels like ages ago. Brennan knelt beside her. If you were a girl ages ago, <clears throat> oh, then I'm a relic. <laughs> they both traced circles around their hearts with their fingers. I... well... <laughs> We've already said the common prayer. Is there anything in particular you'd like to ask for, Sir Brennan? Hmm. Is it sacrilege to wonder if it makes any difference what we ask for? I certainly hope not. In my experience, it's a coin toss. But the primary reason to pray is to listen for the voice of Galadin. On very good days, we may hear him. Then that is what I wish, to hear the voice of Galadin. Yes, of course. Nia bowed her head again, but took a moment to collect her thoughts this time. Lord Galadin, we beg of you... Uh, guidance. 
to, to know injustice when we see it, and lies when we hear them. This we pray. Is there another prayer you might say? I couldn't promise it would do anything the first two didn't. Nothing in any of the books you read. That is not why my order reads books. Oh, I thought it was to bring wisdom. Yes, but wisdom is no simple thing, and the path to it is ever winding. Or you're just walking in circles, patting yourselves on the back the whole way. Sir Brennan, whatever the truth is of what we're being asked to face, it is not the fault of me or of my order. I don't know the scripture as you do, but does it not say that we're all but swords of Galadon and fate is the fire that forges the sword? Yes. Then why does everyone of your ilk do all in their power to smother the fire? Reading heretics and infidels and chaos worshippers and Galadon knows what else. We do not smother the fire, Sir Brennan. We quench the sword. I don't know arms as you do. But what happens when you take a sword straight out of the forge fire and set to fighting with it? That's not... The Order of the Quill teaches that learning and reason are the water, without which the sword of the faithful may be bent to crooked purpose. Is that what you think, then? That I'm bent to crooked purpose? That remains to be seen. Just answer me one thing, then. When you sit there praying, when's the last time you heard anything? I hear something every time I pray. I... Is that so? Yes. It just... It grows harder to make out what it is. When I, when I was young, I could hear him as clearly as my mother calling me in for supper. Now it's as if I'm trying to understand something shouted across a city square. And... If you see that as a condemnation of how I keep my faith, I suppose I have no way to prove you wrong. But it is still the best way I know, and I'll not apologize for it. Nor should you, I suppose, if that is your conviction. I will, however, apologize if I've been less useful to you as a religious advisor than I ought to have been, especially in this moment. You've seen more tragedy than you deserve. A crisis of faith would not be unheard of. My faith hasn't waned. I think that's the problem. We've just grown angrier the more God and has failed this world. I prayed after my father died. I prayed after Prince Unther died. I prayed after Queen Dagmar died. When King Gunther died, I stopped. I fear that if I tried now, I'd only have a curse on my tongue. It's often those we love the most who make us the angriest. Now that is wisdom. You're right that this isn't your fault. You've been to us wise and good counsel. It is not fair to expect you to have every answer. True. Though I fear we are all soon to be asked more than is fair. I think I must... <clears throat> walk some more. Brennan Rose. Come find me again if you wish. I imagine I'll be here a while longer. And Sir Brennan, I hope you find what you are seeking. And you, Nia. You'll make at least as good a priest as I have a knight. A staggering compliment. If our paths must diverge, be sure to say farewell. Mm. And then he was gone. In the south of Jordan, Arden and Maguire had reached the crest of a small rise. Maguire took the opportunity to look behind them for signs of being followed. I think we actually lost the wretch. Would you help me pitch this tent, Arden? Mm. Wait, that... Yeah! Well, there goes the first stake. On second thought, I'll handle the tent. You can chop the firewood. Are you sure McConnor's shield is this far inland? I think we would be safer going along the coast. Shield this way, ich ist sure. I am sure is the expression. Ah, you are getting much better. A few days ago you'd fly into a rage just at hearing the common. Slave tongue. Look, I don't like how the war turned out any more than you do, but if we're going to keep fighting, we need to stay clear-eyed about where we stand. And everyone today speaks the common. Mans! Men, Arden. 
more than one man is men. Men's? No, that's when someone bleeds out of the- That was when Maguire looked up and saw where Arden was pointing. Emerging from a wood below were two figures shambling towards the rise in a hurry. As they grew closer, it became clear they were shackled, but trying to run as fast as they could. Sorry-looking bastards. This is why we should have stuck to the coast. Let me get presentable. Maguire looked around in search of something to cover his more decayed bits. That was when two elvish riders emerged from the wood in apparent pursuit of the shackled figures. Invaders! Oh, matron, help me. Arden, let's take a moment to... But Arden was already sprinting down the hill with hammer raised high, and Maguire had no choice but to stroll down after him. Uh, Feck. As the elvish riders closed to within 50 yards of their quarry, they raised their repeating crossbows, and then a strange sound filled their keen elvish ears. What in Selberon? Halt, or you'll be shot! Both riders loosed bolts at Arden, but his gargantuan frame was more nimble than it had any right to be. Repass! With one swing of his hammer, Arden nearly beheaded one of the horses. It fell, pinning its rider beneath its lifeless flank. The other rider reacted quickly and shot a bolt at Arden, who rolled out of the way with cat-like grace, dodging towards the elf. Attempting to break away, the rider spurred her steed into a mad gallop. Yeah. Arden ready to strike for the rider as she passed, but was struck in the shoulder from a bolt by the Pindelf, whom you might recall was called Sergeant Sarmin. Club. Arden, barely distracted by the new wound, strode towards Sarmin, who shot once more, but Arden knocked the dart away with the shaft of his hammer. Before the elf could shoot again, Arden brought his hammer down on the crossbow, splintering it, along with its wielder's hand. Then Arden turned his attention back to the other rider, who had turned and was lining up for another shot. But this one was struck by a javelin from an unseen source. It did not pierce her moon-silver armor, but did stun her out of her chance at Arden, and Arden made the most of his opportunity. Arden returned to the pinned and lamed sergeant. Have you any idea what you're doing, you damned fool? Ja. Arden raised his hammer high. You put men in chains. Men don't wear chains. Those aren't men. They're... You shut up now. Arden now turned to the two he had seemingly just liberated. So astonished were they by what they had just seen that it only now occurred to them to be frightened of the giant, violent man walking towards them. They tried to back away but quickly tripped over their shackles. Arden towered over them. Their faces were painted in smeared grey and their pupils were a deep red. They raised their hands in abject surrender. Are you friends to the motherland or to the invaders who ravage her? They looked at each other. That'll do you no good, Arden. These two actually don't speak the common. And come here, let me break off that dart. We'll have to wait till we've built a fire to pull the head out. I twas cut shut, Maguire. What do you mean, no speak common? Throw. You mean to say that was a good throw? And these new friends? At this, Maguire bowed to the two terrified persons on the ground before him. But in doing so, he accidentally revealed the decaying body beneath his cloak. The men recoiled. Ah, yes. <clears throat> you'll have to pardon my condition. I promise you'll get used to it. You see, Arden, these two are from the west of the Black Mountains. This land split in a way since you've been a slumber. When I told you the elves ruled and everyone spoke the common, that's true this side of the mountains. On the other side, though, well, the elves can still do what they want to whom they want, but the old ways are not quite so dead and gone. Men don't wear chains! Arden lifted his hammer high. The duo was paralysed by fear until... <laughs> Arden brought his hammer down on their chains. But though the force was tremendous, the chains did not break. 
Arden hit the chain again and again as the two men sat mere inches from the swings, frightfully aware that the wrong move could land them below the head of the great weapon. Ah, that'll never do, Harden. The elves' metal working is a fearsome thing. I've an idea, though. Maguire went to the corpse of one of the fallen elves and rummaged through his saddlebag. Ah, here, try this. Maguire tossed Arden a key. Arden looked at the device, looked at the chains, then began pummeling the chain with the key. No, 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 you'll break the key, stop. Give it here. Maguire took the key from Arden and unlocked the chains. Ah, hell sorcery. Maguire addressed the two prisoners and pointed towards where the black mountains jutted over the horizon. Girls to Esther do? They nodded. Well, so are we as it happens. Why don't we travel together for a spell? Tell me, have you ever heard of McConnor's shield? We return once more to the tent near Freehold, wherein Regan's wounds were being tended. And that introduction is going to apply on several levels because I'm a good narrator and I love you. Got your brandy. Give it here. You made a deal? Okay, you wanna... You done? Yeah. Should I pour you this drink or is that a capital offense too? Deal was I decide what a sip is. Fine. Need anything else? Need? No. Great. Don't drink yourself to death. Wait. I like it better when we're talking. Okay. Is there something you'd like to talk about? Look, I said I shouldn't have drawn on you. You didn't deserve it, but you know why I did it. I just thought we were past deadly weapons is all. <laughs> I'm never past deadly weapons. You know things about me I've never told anyone. Because I trusted you. And then you turn around and threaten to kill me? I didn't ask for your trust. Then don't be surprised when we don't talk. Stop taking everything personal, okay? I'm real good at taking care of myself. People around me, not so much. Just who I am. I don't know how to break this to you, but lately you've kind of fallen off your taking care of yourself game. So as long as you don't have hands, you'd better start getting used to the general concept of friendship. Useful strategies for friendship include gratitude and... Humility and apologies? They usually don't include jujitsu and knives. You have boring friends. I'm trying here, Regan. You gotta be at least a little open with me. I'll try again later, I guess. Okay, you want open? I watched my eight-year-old sister shit herself to death in a rat-filled alley. She ate something rotten because I couldn't find her a decent meal. I was ten. That open enough? I After that, I kind of stopped planning to die of old age. I'm not trying to kill myself, you understand, just sort of knowing for a fact I was going to die young. By all rights, that fire in the forest should have been it for me. Would have been without you. And Nia. And Brennan. And now I have to admit I'm glad it wasn't. So I guess that's my fucked up, backward way of saying thanks. Well, you're welcome. I wasn't going to just let you die. Like I said, thanks. I should say... Not that I didn't overreact, but general rule about touching people who don't want to be touched. I know. I know you're right. You'd think I would know better. Sorry. Forget it. I'd say we're even. We're all works in progress, I guess. And I know I'm not always the easiest to run with. <laughs> you are goddamn impossible sometimes. But you also might be the baddest bitch I have ever met. And God help me. I think I admire you. Well, you could do worse, I guess. You could do better, but you could also do a fuck of a lot worse. Whatever happened when you were ten wasn't your fault. I know what you're trying to do, and I appreciate it, but not tonight. Tonight, Maggie gets very, very drunk. You're welcome to join me. Ah. Uh, uh, uh. Would you like me to pour the drinks? Yeah, that'd be good. To something resembling friendship. Uh, uh, what's that? What's what? Poking out from your leg? I'm just real happy we made up is all. Regan, you made a deal. 
Fine. Regan rooted around in her trousers for a long, long moment before finally producing one last dagger and presenting it to Jen. Yeah, you can just drop that on the ground. It was late by the time Nia returned to the camp near Freehold. Nelson awaited her by her tent. Hello, Nelson. Is something the matter? Well, I, you know, I was just going to talk to you earlier, but I saw you were praying, so you know, I, I don't want to bother you. That was considerate of you. Are you sure you're all right? Um, but Billy and Jen just wanted me to ask you uh, how we got here, so... Yes, I suppose our discussion did get cut a bit short the other day. And then with everything that's happened since... Yes, yeah, what I mean. Is there any research we can do with everything all up in the air? There will be much to sort out come morning, but there is little to be done tonight. You will have my help, though, of course, when the time is right. I would not abandon you. Yeah, I, I know. Thanks. If that's all for now... Look, I'm, I'm sorry I got kind of mad before. Think nothing of it. We've had a stressful day. It's, it's easy to forget how different our lives are, so... Funny. I feel I am often reminded how different our lives are. It's kind of kick-ass. You know, that, that you get to look like you look and go your whole life and never feel less than anyone because of it, it's... You're living the dream. <laughs> Shouldn't have to take all my problems. Some would argue that that is precisely the role of a priest. But I take your point and accept your apology. Good night. Hey, are, um... Are you okay? I am very frightened, Nelson. You must understand... Whatever their motives, or virtues, or vices, the elves are the nexus of power in this world. If things are as you say, then those of us unwilling to ignore enormous evil must spend the rest of our likely short and brutish lives fighting a nigh unwinnable war. And in that case, I would advise you and your friends to leave here as soon as you can. I wouldn't do that. This is my fight, too. Please. I don't want any of you to have to live through such times. Me neither, but... But that is not for us to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. That is very beautifully said. No, it's not mine. Even uh, white South Africans have good ideas sometimes. Sometimes. Get some rest, Nelson. If you believe in prayer... Pray for wisdom and courage and strength. But above all else, pray that you are mistaken. On the road west from the White Forest, Yellowine rode with his new travelling companion, Devard. Well, 14 new travelling companions if you count the pigeons, not a one of which seemed to appreciate the value of a contemplative silence. So back to Duel of Crones. I dare say Gale of Winds is by far the strongest book in the whole series. Don't you agree? As I have said, I only made it halfway through Ash That Sings. Ah, yes! Well, you really ought to get through it. That second book can be a bit of a bore sometimes, but it is worth it to set up a third. Ah, yes. Well, for perhaps the sixth time, my Caltea duties have eaten into my leisure time of late. Oh, yes, you must tell me more about that when we've the time. I can say I miss my former traveling companions more and more with each passing minute. I'd be happy to lend you my copy so you can catch up, but we need to ask for it when the next pigeon goes out. Sorry to say, now I have only ants on wagons with me. What? Wagons? That's not truly the title of the fifth book, is it? Oh, yes. When the prince comes from the east to court, he brings with him a collection of female family members to aid his finding a mate. But the prince's closest aunt is framed for the murder of Smaller Deke, which is actually perpetrated by... Oh. Dave. Apologies, I forgot you've not read that far. Truth be told, Shrew that knows is most likely the weakest work of the series. So much time is devoted to coronation ceremony of Prince Victor. But well, why would Prince Victor be crowned? I guess you'll have to wait and see. Unless... Ah, King Valentine dies, doesn't he? Maybe. Damn it, Dave. Do you think we could stop for a moment, David? Nature must run its course. Ah, uh, yes, of course. 
Yellowin walked until he was a comfortable distance from Devard, which under the circumstances was rather far indeed. Best be careful! This reminds me of when the Watchmen of the Ward are attacked by the dark demons at the end of book... Oh, sorry! <sighs> Only then did he open the hidden pouch on his belt. Yelodik, you are truly a lifesaver. He placed a sizable helping of cannab root inside his cheek. You know, that good good. And walked back towards the road. Feeling better? An unbidden smile began pulling at the corner of Yellowin's lips. You know, I think I am. Dave, I believe I would like to hear your synopsis. You would? Are you sure you're ready? By now, Yellowin's face and his eyes had begun to glaze over. Oh, yes. Perhaps we could do it over a meal. I'm quite hungry. It was a late hour as Brennan found himself wandering the keep's halls. In spite of the time, the men there scurried busily, repairing the fortifications, transporting equipment. But Brennan seemed to pay them no mind. It was a while, therefore, before Brennan came to realize where he had wandered to, the entrance to Bryce Riverfell's study. The two guardsmen posted outside started to attention at Brennan's arrival. Sir! Oh, oh, <clears throat> yes, uh, an audience with Riverfell. Send him in, gents. Right, go ahead. Chaos below. Was that the General Brennan? I never thought I'd live to see the day. Don't act so surprised, it's vulgar. Oh, right. I used to be an adventurer like him, then I took an arrow in Yeah, the... we know, Egbert. Not a day goes by we don't hear about your damn knee. It hurts. The until recently respectable study of General Bryce Riverfell was looking considerably worse for the wear of battle. The walls were damaged, papers were strewn about, and prominent on Riverfell's desk was a near-finished bottle of brown liquid, the scent of which hung sweet and heavy in the air. Nevertheless, Brennan ceremoniously dipped his head as he entered, and Bryce saluted. Sir Brennan. Uh, Commander Riverfell, I request an audience with you. Audience with me? What songs are we playing? Songs? I do not... <laughs> it's a joke. We can still joke, can't we? Uh, apologies. I find myself slow to laugh of late, General. You should try. Sometimes it's all we've got. And I think you can call me Bryce in here. Drink? No, thank you. Suppose that's uh, presumptuous of me, now that you outrank me and all. It's not that. I'd just rather have my head clear tonight. Mm. You know, it's funny... One thing I promised myself long ago to never do is sit in a room by myself and get drunk. So I got my old man and it's nowhere I want to go. But after this last battle, oh, truth be told, sometimes I feel so weak I want to explode. Bryce threw back his drink. <coughs> I'll, uh... Thank you not to bring me up on slovenly conduct charges. You've survived the nigh-impossible challenge, General. Few would think less of you. A real challenge still to come, I think. Rebuilding, you mean. That's part of it. How's, uh, how's things by you? One of yours was wounded the other day, if memory serves. Well, we got to her in time to save her life. And she seems herself again. All we dare pray for, I guess. If there's any help I can offer... I thank you, Brace. I know you've little to spare right now. I'd have nothing without you and yours bailing us out. Just doing my duty. Right then, I shan't take any more of your time. Brennan turned to leave. Eh, really all that brought you here in the middle of the night? Brennan stopped, but did not turn back around just yet. What do you fight for, Bryce? That is a good question, Brennan. I've always said it's for the farmer who's counting on me to fight so he can just raise his crops in peace and kiss his wife at night. I would have been him if my life broke just a little different. A fine reason, I suppose. Why don't you have a seat? What's troubling you, soldier to soldier? My whole life, 
I always fought for him, King Gunther, that is. Peace will be his rest. Bryce had the sense to wait in silence for the grizzled knight to continue. I had barely eleven years when I took my first life. Templars of discord burned my village, killed my father. One of them, our neighbor, was captured alive. I buried my axe in her black heart. My rage was all I had back then. Then his majesty took me in, fed me, sheltered me, raised me higher above my birth than I ever dared dream. When he said someone needed to die, I killed them, still with that boyish rage. And by the time the rage faded, I'd grown used to killing. I never had to wonder if I was doing the right thing. If Gunther asked it, I knew in my heart it was good and just. You, uh, admired him very much. (laughs) My admiration for him was so vast that it would sometimes take my breath away. If you've never been in the presence of royalty, I do not think you can understand what that's like. And now he's gone, and you're wondering why you still are fighting. I've been telling myself that as long as I can fight for his line... Brennan caught himself. uh, His legacy, that is. By combating the damned usurper Redmore. Our Del Redmore on the high throne is something we should all take pains to avoid. (sighs) It's a privilege you had, though, Brennan. Not all soldiers get to serve someone they admire. Brennan caught the briefest flicker in Bryce's eyes just then. The look of a man realizing he may have said too much. Do you not admire who you serve? Like I said, I prefer to think my master is the common farmer trying to put food on the table. I admire him. Aye, but you took your oath before the elves and the lords of men. (laughs) Do you not admire them? If you hadn't noticed, uh, my answer was what men of our trade might call a tactical retreat. But Bryce saw by the look in Brennan's eyes that he would not relent. I keep my oath. I hold my fort. No one ever said admiration was a job requirement. But surely you think their cause is just. Which one? Defending your people. Our people against the Orc hordes. Yeah. Well, that's what's been fucking with me since the battle. Let me ask you, did you notice the weapons the orcs carried into battle? I fought several bearing steel. I had presumed that they had taken them off of our fallen by the time I arrived. They were certainly ours, but I don't think they were taken off our fallen. See, the smith I commissioned them from, I bought from him before, a fellow from Ironhurt's lands. Decent man, good for his word. So he and I took reasonable precautions against theft. Only people who know who those weapons were for and where they were being stored were me, him, and the one patrol I sent to collect them who never came back. And even they didn't know what they were picking up. So the smith gave up the secret. How else could Traft have gotten them? Poor devil. I can only imagine what tortures the orc... We found the smith among the war dead on the orc front lines. Shot full of elf darts. Until the day he died, Brennan would swear that a frigid breeze blew through the damaged wall just then and chilled his bones. All I can say is that there was no wind. Some spell of the Templars the might Templars have been. had that kind of magic. You think they'd use it once and only once on a backwoods tradesman without a minute of combat training? Though we should that, talk about the Templars' that, interest in that your... That treasonous whore, son! Betraying his kinsmen for... For what? A handful of gems? I'm sorry you misjudged him so badly, Bryce. Clearly he was the furthest thing from a decent man. Brennan, I trusted that man because his family was killed in an orc raid a couple years back. That sound like the makings of a mercenary to you? What? What could possess a man to do that? I don't know. But I imagine it's not too far off from what made Traft the way he is. Traft is a half-breed savage. So they say. But we met him. He really seemed that savage to you? Shit, he was less fixin' for a fight than you and I were. Ah, enough of this damnable orc-loving nonsense. Not you as wi- Not you, Bryce. I'm not saying we should paint our faces blue and start burning things. Traft was stringing up little kids. I'm not gonna sit here and defend that. 
I'm just saying, if that shy little kid we met all those years ago could turn into Traft, and if this Smith I know who lost his whole family could go along with him, then there is some very big part of this picture that you and I have not seen. So what then? Throw up our hands and surrender just because maybe we're wrong? You came to me. You asked me what I fight for, and I'm telling you honestly, I'm not quite sure. Used to be enough, just isn't anymore. I think the best thing you can do right now is to just get used to that. Bryce went to pour himself another drink. You're not making sense. Stop rotting your brain. But Brennan swiped the bottle out of his hand, and in the wake of the crash, there was a stunned silence. I'm very sorry, Bryce. I should go. But before he could... The guards from the hallway barged in. What's happened? It's all right, gents. I lost my grip, is all. The guards shared a sceptical look between them. I'm fine. If you say so, sir. There's a girl here to see you, by the way. What girl? Seems I really should be going. She's come on the supply train from Bailey's Inn. Think it was one of those two what rode with you before the battle. No shit. Send her in. Brennan, I think you will want to be here for this. You see now, lassie. Why, who is she? Galladin's mercy. Gwen. At the Horse's Head Inn, Arlene was doing her best to tend to her duties. It was nearly the middle of the night, and most of the patrons had left or gone to bed. But there were still a few in need of service. Sister, be a dear and top me off. (laughs) And how about one of them cherry tarts? The world may be going to Gradian's arsehole, but it won't see me off without a bit of sweetness to lighten the journey. Right away, sir. You're lucky I think there are only a few left. They've been quite popular. Summer on your tongue, Ma Bailey says. You seem familiar. You haven't been with Bailey long, have you? Not very long, no. Funny. I could swear I've seen you before, but then I get around, I do. Merrill H. Marigold of Merrill's Mystical Moving Emporium. You heard of me, yes? I'm afraid I haven't. I led a very isolated life before... before I came here. Nonsense. I've sold to you before. I have. I'd never forget a face so pretty. Young girls do love their ribbons and bobs. It was up at the castle, I think. Gods, I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Let me... I'll clean it up right away. Just please don't tell Ma Bailey. Come now. Don't worry your pretty little head. When war times come, it's tough to hold on to anything good. Things get all messy. I thought when I first came here that my life was finally about to begin. It seemed like heaven. (laughs) Well, that's the first time anyone said that about a Bailey establishment. Sweet tarts and sour beer? Yeah. But heaven? That's another N, I think. You should have seen how I used to live. But then all the fighting started. And this baby... I feel as if I haven't slept in weeks. As if on cue, the child, which slept in a basket near the bar, began to wail. Arlene rushed to quiet it before Miss Bailey could hear its cries. Shh, shh, I know, I know. Oh, lass, you have a lovely voice, even covered in spilled beer. You remind me of my own mother. Actually, it's probably because of the spilled beer, if I'm being honest. Well, that and the song. It was a favorite of hers. Well, I'm not the mother of this child. His mother died. Poor little thing. It is a hard thing to lose a parent so young. I thought I did the right thing, taking him in. Now I'm not so sure. He cries and cries, and nothing seems to soothe him save singing. I cannot lose my place here. I have nowhere else to go. Perhaps it was in memory of his own mother. Or perhaps our Merrill was getting soft in his old age. Or perhaps, as I like to think, despite all evidence to the contrary, there are still folk who will do good for no other reason than because it pleases them to do so. Merrill began to dig through his large pack. After a few moments of rustling, he produced a small wooden box. When he opened it, a soft, tinny music floated out. (laughs) 
Ah, there. You see? Sweet sounds do tame the savage beast. Oh, how lovely. Wherever did you find such a thing? Hither and yon, my lass. Hither and yon. It is yours, if you want it. I doubt I could pay you what you'd ask for it. I ask for nothing. Think of it as a kindness, paid in turn for your own. Thank you. And if you happen to mention that you got this magical box from the great Merrill's Mystical Moving Emporium, well, I shan't stop you. Me, oh my. Never thought I'd see the day. Why, what is it? At the sound of the horn, Bailey burst in from the kitchen in a near panic. Anna, run and get the finery. We've important guests. Who? See for yourself. Through the threshold of the horse's head in, Arlene saw six riders approaching, opalescent armor shimmering in the moonlight. Those, my lass, are the Knights of the Wood. That standard they fly is for the Lord Commander's personal guard. Now, I trust you recall that Arlene Redmore's departure from Castle Gwenatal was, if not strictly speaking illegal, then very much not the sort of thing done, and by necessity highly secretive. And if you do not recall this, I can assure you that Arlene did. Well, girl, don't just stand there gawking. Make haste. Knights of the... No, they can't see me. They mustn't. Because I'll spill the wine or burn the bread. I'm a terrible bar girl. I'll bring shame upon you, Miss Bailey. I know I will. What am I supposed to do? Serve them on my own? Ugh. You're not wrong, though. Oh, no. Not him, too. Anna, take him. If either of you makes a scene, you're out. Last chance, do you understand? Desperately, Arlene began to gather the baby and his accoutrements. Between the basket, the baby, the bottle, and the music box, her arms were more than full. It will forever be a wonder to me how such tiny humans managed to amass so many necessary items in such a short amount of time. Of course, thank you. I'll just take him on a walk. We'll come back when- Don't be daft! It's near midnight! Just sit with him in the corner, pretend you're a guest, and for Galadon's sake, keep quiet. Arlene had no time to respond. As the door swung open, she all but dove into a corner booth and turned her back to the inn's new visitors. Miss Bailey turned, beaming to her new guests, her arms wide open as if to hug the Lord Commander. She thought better of it and turned the gesture into an awkward but enthusiastic curtsy. Lord Commander, as I live and breathe, truly it is an honour to have your men grace us with a visit. If you're looking for the comforts of home, head to the horse's head in, that's what they say. <sighs> Who's they? Can I get you a glass of our mulled wine? Or perhaps something stronger? Or sweeter? Or better? As or Miss Bailey babbled and bustled drink. about the common room, Lord like Commander Relotith's elvish perception in took in all. A few patrons huddled near the fire, their attention on the new arrivals. A young mother cradled a sleeping baby in the corner, her face ducked against the child's soft swaddling. Ree trained her gaze on this cloth especially. Frayed, worn, loved. Hush, hush, be still. Oh dear, Lord Commander, are you ill? I have a tonic that will- Thank you, good woman, that won't be necessary. I don't plan on staying long. I'm here on business, you see. Business, my lord. The Knights of the Wood are making rounds in search of any orcs that may have escaped us at the battleground. Mercy! Can you imagine? Well, yes. That's why I'm here. Right. Well, we've seen no orcs here. Thank Galadon. Then Galadon for the crops and the sunshine. As for keeping the orcs away, we only have each other's constant vigilance to thank. It's for that reason that I'm afraid I must impose upon you and your guests to speak for a few moments. Please do, Lord Commander. Best to be safe, not sorry. That's the Bailey maxim. Now, as you all seem to be... <clears throat> upstanding men and women, I'm sure you feel compelled by conscience as well as by law to report any orcish activity to the nearest garrison. Aye, but of course. But the orc is a crafty devil. He knows tricks and ruses to deceive all but the most trained eye. Which is why we must also be on the lookout for anything that even seems suspicious. Now, has anyone seen anything out of the ordinary they'd like to tell us about? No one? The smallest detail might help. You never know. Miss Bailey shot a glare towards Arlene and the child, but Relotit calmly turned to face them with a painted-on smile. My word. Is this your child, my dear? 
Arlene, whose waxing courage would not allow her to raise her head to meet the elf size, vehemently shook her head no. It's not hers. It was found shortly after the battle. And when I asked, you didn't think that out of the ordinary? Are you accustomed to taking in strange infants? Not accustomed, no. But it didn't seem strange after a big battle like that. Forgive us, my lord. Hmm. Precisely what I mean. Thankfully, there's no harm done this time. We're lucky, in fact. There's a mother nearby what lost her little one in the chaos of fleeing the battle. I dare say that's the one right there. You don't say. We'll gladly take the poor dear off your hands and return it to its loving mother. Re reached her arms out for the child. At this, the almost visibly shaking Arlene gulped in a deep breath and finally raised her head. Where... Oh, where's the mother from? I'm sorry. You'll have to face me, my dear. My hearing's not what it used to be. Arlene Redmore studied the child for a fleeting moment, still unable to hold its own head up, its soft face completely without malice or guile, and then with grim resolve, she turned to face the Lord Commander Relotit. Where's the mother from? As the elf looked the woman straight in the eyes, a hint of a smirk tugged at the former's lips. Ma, but it is hard to hear over the poor thing's wailing. Can you do anything to quiet it down? Arlene produced Meryl's music box from her pocket. Lovely tune. Now, what was your question? Where's the mother from? I'm certainly no expert in the human dialects, but yours is a very particular accent. There's a hint of peasantry from House Redmore's lands. But no, that's not quite right. Where are you from? Oh, you know, Hivignon, in it. Hivignon, indeed. Uh, funny, that's exactly where the mother is from. <laughs> where she's from is her business. My business is to see that everything in this world is where it belongs. Now come. Relotit reached out for the child once more, but Arlene only pulled him closer to her. What is your connection to this child? None, my lord. Only, I suppose it's not the one you're after. Wouldn't want it out in this cold for nothing, let alone got its mother's hopes up. She's from the mill in town to the west of here. Does that satisfy? Then that's not the child at all, my lord. Found him east. By the water. By the water? Did you see anyone else nearby? No, no, my lord. My dear girl, if you'll take us outside and show us the exact spot, it would be much appreciated. Now, my lord? But it's so cold and I've not got a winter cloak. I can tell you the exact spot. Even draw it on a map if you got one. Relotit took a quick inventory of the other faces in the room, all entirely enraptured by the conversation. Yes, I suppose that would be all right. She produced a scroll from somewhere on her belt and placed it on the table in front of Arlene. There you are. Take your time and be sure to find the right spot. And as she turned back to the rest of the room, Arlene briefly closed her eyes in a silent prayer of thanks. Hush now. Now, while I have everyone's attention, there's one more matter in which I could use your help. I assume you've all heard tell of the disappearance of the Lady Arlene Redmore? Arlene went white. The lady went missing mere hours after her marriage to Lord Antonin of House Mooncrest. Mooncrest blamed Redmore, Redmore blamed Mooncrest, and now the two houses are at war. Lord Ardell Redmore has alleged that the Lady Arlene was kidnapped by her handmaiden, who disappeared along with her. He's offered a substantial reward for the return of his sister. Alive, of course. And the handmaiden, dead or alive. So if any of you have seen two unknown women traveling about together, one highborn and one low... Anyone? Miss Bailey. You've many travelers come through I'll here. show you. Say again, dear? I'll show you the spot outside. It will be easier. Ah, splendid. 
And take the child. Perhaps we can clear this all up right now and I'll depart directly. As soon as they were outside the inn, Ree gave Arlene a very perfunctory bow. Lady Redmore, or should I say Mooncrest? My, but we are resourceful. Please, my lord. Gwen did not kidnap me. Gwen? Oh, of course, the handmaiden. <laughs> yes, I know she didn't kidnap you. Our flight was my idea. I ordered her to help me. She mustn't be treated as a criminal. Her treatment will depend very much on your actions, my lady. So, let's take a walk, and you can show me where you found this child. After you. Arlene started off in the direction of the stream. Re motioned to one of her lieutenants, who covertly handed her a cloth bundle a few feet in length, and then she followed after Arlene. Now, at that moment, the aforementioned handmaiden was in Bryce Riverfell's study at Freehold and face to face with Brennan, to the surprise of all three present. General Brennan! Gwen of Ruefield. Peace be praised. Thank all that is good. We feared the worst for you after everything at the castle. Aye, I've heard the tales the usurper Ardell is spreading about me. We knew for sure he was lying, but we also knew he'd have it in for you. What a relief to see you in one piece. How fair is your lady? I pray she is not still... You've not heard. We fled to keep. On the day of my lady's wedding, as it happens. Is it so? Fortune continues to favour the bold, it seems. That is well. Ardell was a cruel wretch when his rank was low. Now, I quake with fury to imagine. I, I'd never have left my lady there alone with him on the high throne. And I'll not leave him on the high throne. Not for long. That much I swear to you. As uh, <clears throat> much as this reunion is warm in my heart, uh, it is, and I needed it. I need to ask why you're here, Miss Gwen. I thought we both understood it was safest for you to stay at Bailey's. I'm here on my lady's behalf. There's something I'm to ask you, General Riverfell, and it's for your ears only. Though... I'm sure my lady never imagined General Brennan would be here. You know, he's been knighted. He has. Gwen gave a curtsy and a beaming smile. Sir Brennan, well-deserved and long overdue, if I may say. When was this? It, uh, it was a very private ceremony. I can tell you more later. Uh, about this question, Miss Gwen. Aye. I suppose if there was anyone at Castle Guanatal my lady would have trusted, would have been you, Sir Brennan. Perhaps you can help as well. Only, do you think you could send your men a mite further away, General Riverfell? Bryce seemed confused, but saw the urgency in Gwen's eyes. How's about you go out for a stroll, gents? Appreciate it. Now then. Right. We found a child. A child? A wee little babe. Couldn't have seen two moons yet. Its mother died in a field near the inn. My lady and I have been caring for it, but we can't do that very long. And you come to see if I can track down any of its kin? Well, that's the thing. See, this child looked normal in every way. Sweetest little thing you ever saw, except it cries a lot. But the mother looked like an orc. Brennan and Bryce immediately locked eyes. I know, it was folly to take it in, but I couldn't leave it out to starve. First things first, is my lady in any danger? From the child? No, but you shouldn't have it. You say it looks just like a human child? Might get teased by other children for having such light eyes, but otherwise you'd never think it wasn't born a min. But the mother was an orc. Looks so to me. Skin all grey and blue, though that turned out to be paint. But yeah, bright red eyes. I think I must see this child with my own eyes. Where is your lady staying? At the Horsehead Inn. You know it? Aye. No, I must be back before dawn. I'll have to make haste. I'm sure you can stay here, Gwen, if you're road-weary. I'll come. My lady will be overjoyed to see you. I hope you don't mind a rough ride, then. I'll uh, try and think of something while you're gone. I don't want you two keeping the thing, but this is a big thing to ask. I know. Thank you, General. Godspeed to both of you. And so did they depart, just as soon as they were able, in the direction of the horse's head in and Arlene's frightful midnight stroll with Lord Commander Relotit. And oh, dear listeners, how neat and tidy it would have been if some time jump in our tale could place them at the inn in time to interrupt said stroll. But alas, Brennan and Gwen are still a few hours' ride away. They will not rescue Arlene. This is where I found the child. As the lady came to a halt beside the stream, the elf kept ten yards behind her, Good. 
I must ask you something now that we're away from pioneers. When you found this child, was it near its mother? I already told you. Now beware. If you lie to me about this, then I've no reason to believe you about the alleged innocence of your dear... Gwyn, was it? So once more, did you find this child with its mother? Yes, I did. And the mother did not appear to be of the human race, did she? No, she didn't. She appeared to be of the orcish race. Yes. <laughs> yes, she was. There's no need to cry, my lady. Your honesty has served the realm well, and I thank you for it. I'd like to show you something, if you'd be so kind as to look to the horizon over yonder. All right. <laughs> what am I looking for? Though Arlene was never the sporting type, she had known enough summers at court to recognize the sound of a bow being drawn. You coward. You bring me all the way out here to kill me and you can't even look me in the eye. There's a small joint behind the skull where it meets the neck. Piercing it causes instant and painless death. I'm unaccustomed to this primitive fletching on these orcish arrows, but if you're still, I'm sure I can strike the target. If you run or squirm or raise a ruckus, however, I can be sure to hit you, but I can't be sure it'll be painless. You decide. You said yourself there are people looking for me. How do you hope to get away with this? Like I said, orcish arrow. It'll look like a raiding party. Now take a moment to still yourself so as not to flinch. It helps if you look dead. Gwen knows nothing about any of this. You must leave her be. Please. A moment, I said. Do not make me regret my compassion. <laughs> Goodbye, Gwen. We had songs and kisses and laughter for a few days at least. For that, I'd gladly give my life. I'll wait for you in Galadin's Green Garden. She's gathered her skirts above the knee, and she's gone to the wishing well to see if the one that she loves waits for her all alone at the wishing well. Despite her decades of training, the elf general found herself just the slightest bit distracted by some strange quality of Arlene's song. But, ever the consummate professional, she drew in her breath, waiting to time her release with the exhale. And then... Oh! She was struck on the head by the droppings of a pigeon, which was soon joined by eleven of its mates. What the devil? And then, cresting a nearby hill came the erstwhile Kaltir to the until recently great House Gwernthal. Those are mine. <laughs> oh, I left the cage open by mistake. <laughs> I'm terribly... By Kaladin's grace, Lord Commander, what a fancy meeting you out here. Good evening. Good evening. What brings Is you... Is that... Is that Arlene Redmore? The Once and Future Nerd is directed by Christian T. Kelly Madeira. It is created and executive produced by Zach Glass and Christian T. Kelly Madeira and co-executive produced by Jess Kelly Madeira. Alex Story and Ryan Cushman are associate producers. It is performed by... Rhiannon Angel. Garrett Arman. Dan Dobransky. Anya Gibeon. Ian Harkins. Paul Notis. Juliet Prather. Frank Quares. Julie Reed. Gregory M. Schultz. And guest starring Zach Valenti as Meryl. Production audio recording by Jared Paul, with second unit recording this chapter by Zach Valenti. Editing by Josh Perot. Post-production mixing and sound design by Garrett Schultz. Tom Lee is our musical director and lead composer, with additional scoring by Chris Montalbo. For more, visit onceandfuturenerd.com or find us on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, or Reddit. <laughs> <laughs>